And he said, no, conservatism isn't dead. It's just intellectually boring. And I thought, well, yeah, liberalism is too. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today we're talking to Sam Tannenhaus, the editor of the New York Times Book Review, The Week in Review, and the author of The Death of Conservatism. Sam, thanks for talking to hey, us. Hey, Nick, glad to be here with you. Conservatism is dead? No. What, what I, killed it? Right. Actually, I don't think it, it's dead. The, the, the title actually, now, it's true the New Republic story I wrote was given the headline, Conservatism is right. Dead. And this uh, is the death I'm of, sorry, but your book is called The, the death, death of Conservatism, of conservatism. which is a little different. Okay. It's not declarative. Okay. It's a proposition. Okay. And the proposition would be that this is the moment for conservative intellectuals. I don't worry so much about the politicians mm -hmm. and the parties. Parties find talented leaders, and they're able to rally the groups. They become tribunes of the movement. But what movement will they be tribunes of? Uh, Bill Buckley, whose biography I'm writing, um, once told me that Goldwater and Reagan came to me, he said, because I asked him, how did you find them? And he said, no, they found me. And what he meant was, he had the ideas. He had the vocabulary. And that's what they needed. And, you know, I'm a kind of a literary person, as you are. And, and I think of politics being, in large part, about the words we use and the way we use them, the way we conduct a debate and a discussion. And what conservatism has lost, it seems to me, the hardcore conservatism, the polarized or partisan conservatism, is the capacity to elevate the argument. The genius of Buckley was that he made liberals think and write better. Yeah, you uh, write in, in your book, uh, Commentary National Review, the Weekly Standard, are mouthpieces of the Republican Party at its most revanchist. That's what, what it, it And so are you saying that uh, the conservative thinkers, not Republican Party operatives, but conservative thinkers have drained the debate on their side of any serious engagement of ideas? Well, I think to a large extent they have. Now, it's not to say every single one of them has, and that one will never see an interesting argument on the, on the right. You know, uh, you do it in your magazine. George Will does it um, every now and we again. We don't actually, I mean, we'll get to libertarianism, but I'm not sure that that's, it's part of the right anymore. Well, that, that's, uh, that's another question, whether it is. That may be a reflection of, of where things have gone. In the Buckley day, you know, there was always some room for Buckley was a kind of libertarian. Now, that, you know, there were, there were questions about yeah, that. Right. And Whitaker Chambers was the guy, he, you know, he sicked on Ayn Rand. He was not a uh, libertarian. <laughs> and Buckley called one of his books, or subtitled it, Reflections of a Libertarian Journalist, but then also made sure to write out certain people, such as Rand. Probably. Yeah, well, well, and that was really, had to do with religion. Yeah. You know, Buckley was, you know, a very devout Catholic and, and uh, didn't like atheists. He would had a fight with Max Eastman about that in the early 60s. But I think what's happened is that conservatives don't seem as interested in speaking to the broader audience as they once did. There's a wonderful, or maybe sad, irony in this. One reason Buckley started National Review was because these very gifted men like himself, James Burnham, Whitaker Chambers, were having trouble getting their stuff published in the mainstream press. Every now and again they would, but for the most part they couldn't. They needed their own magazine. Now what we see are magazines and journalists who aren't especially interested in reaching beyond the cloister, reaching outside. They are there to hold up their end of the debate and to support their candidates. I think a really striking example of this was when William Crystal wrote a column for the op-ed page of the New York Times, my employer, and in effect made that column a kind of clearinghouse for the McCain and then Sarah Palin campaign. What do you what do you say to people who note that at the what's what's at the top of the Times bestseller list for nonfiction? Is it uh, Michelle Malkin or Mark Levin or are, are they right oh, Glenn Beck? They're right there. I mean, absolutely partisan ideological people, uh, and they're they've got the best-selling books in the country. So, sure. does that mean they're only preaching to the choir, or are they actually engaging people in debate? that you may not find fully comfortable? Well, that's a good question. We don't know. We, I, here I am editing the, the New York Times Book Review, and I can't tell you who's buying books on the bestseller list because it's done by the polling right. division of the newspaper. But they, on the strength of the audiences they have, the platforms they have on radio and television, if they are selling only to their own, they will dominate our bestseller list for many years to come. It doesn't take them any copies to get there. I don't say that to denigrate the right. work. It's just that the bestseller list isn't an indication of breadth or depth 
in an argument. If you, uh, could you have e as easily written a book called The Death of Liberalism? Because who, who are the, uh, the eggheads or the visionaries on the left side of the debate? I, I mean, when, you know, for every Glenn Beck, there's a Rachel Maddow uh, or a Keith Oberman, who is certainly not going to be putting Einstein out of uh, memory or out of business anytime soon. Is it just that American political discourse is really hackneyed now? Well, you know, uh, yeah, the answer is yes, I could have written that book. And I've thought about it. Maybe it would make a companion piece to this one. Um, well, we the, all need projects. <laughs> well, you know, there was uh, an interesting comment on uh, this book, The Death of Conservatism, on David Frum's website, the newmajority.com, new by Austin Bramwell, figure you probably know, interesting young guy. And he said, no, conservatism isn't dead. It's just intellectually boring. And I thought, well, yeah, liberalism is too. The reason it seemed worth writing about conservatism is, first of all, I've been studying it for 20 years, uh, since I started writing a biography of Whitaker Chambers in 1989. And also, because conservatism has been the dominant politics of the last era. And so it seemed better to look at it and see where it had gone. Now, it may be a generation from now, we'll look at liberalism and see it eclipsed just the way, it, that's why it seemed important to me in the book I wrote to describe how liberalism failed. What, uh, how much of, of the death of conservatism or, or, or both, uh, you know, hopes for that as well as fears about that depending on where you fall on the ideological spectrum is really a short-term fluctuation in electoral uh, outcomes. Because in 2005, everybody including liberals were talking about we have to get used to the permanent Republican majority uh, and then suddenly by 2006 that was all gone and now it's the Republicans will never win an election again. Right. I think there's too much emphasis on election outcomes and I mentioned this in the book. Now you, could, you can put it a different way and I, I think it's plausible to say the conservative movement really was largely finished off in 1992. Democrats have won pluralities in four out of the last five elections presidential elections. The only one they won, 2004, was in the middle of a war. It was the closest re-election in, in a century. You know, it was three percentage points presented as something larger. So electoral outcomes are tricky. And one other point I'd add for those who are looking at the 2010 election and saying, well, substantial Republican gains mean the end of Obama-style liberalism. Well, in 1938, the Republicans made huge gains in the House of Representatives as what seemed a repudiation of Franklin Roosevelt. It did not end New Deal liberalism. So I think it's less about elections than it is about ideas. And the question now is, are the dominant ideas, the big debates, say, over something like health care, really occurring within one party? Now, there's a theory of politics I cite in the book, Samuel LaBelle's Solar System of Politics, which says what seems to be an equal two-party system is really an alternating system of one-party rule. And so the question is, have we now begun a cycle of democratic rule? I would like conservatives to consider that possibility and think what they might have to do to stop it. That's why I wrote a book about the rise of conservatism at a period when it seemed to be finished. We've been talking with Sam Tannenhaus, the author of The Death of Conservatism, for Reason TV. I'm Nick Gillespie.